Percy asks, where are the skeletons? Why would you ask that? <laughs> yeah, Percy basically pulls the, um, professor, you didn't collect our homework assignment. <laughs> What's good? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm the titular Newest Olympian. I'm a 30-year-old man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid, but I'm reading them now as an adult on a quest to determine if this is a book series that we've all been sleeping on as a society. I'm not on this quest alone, though. I'm never on this quest alone. This time, I'm joined once again by our editor extraordinaire. It's Sherry Guo. Sherry, how's it going? It's going great. Yeah, it's, it's been so long. It's been literally minutes since we've last talked. I think four whole minutes <laughs> where we refilled our waters and we're ready to discuss the next chapter of Percy Jackson and the Titan's Curse, which is chapter 15, which is called I Wrestle Santa's Evil Twin, which is a very fun chapter title. And I just figured he was going to fight some sort of monster. I didn't think it would be the person that it ends up being because I honestly forgot about that person, which Percy also did, so I don't feel too bad about it. But it also made me think of and I tried Googling this so badly, but I couldn't get any results, is there's like an evil Santa that I think is German, but is different than Krampus that I want to say is called Connect Rubric or something similar to that. I had a German boss at the engineering company I interned for, and he told us about this once, and I could be completely butchering it, but I think it's very krampus -y where it's like, oh, if you're not nice, connect rubric will come and hit you with sticks or whatever. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I'm completely butchering it. I don't even know if it's German. If you're out there and this sounds familiar, please let me know, because I tried Googling a lot. I was like, weird evil Santa, not Krampus. I tried every sort of spelling of connect rubric, and it wasn't working, so I don't know what's going on. Help me out. <laughs> Maybe he made it up. Oh, whoa, that would have been really funny. Like German boss just like making up folklore for all these American interns just to be like, oh, whoa, Thomas thought us about this. Ah, he was cool. I don't think he would do that. But maybe he did. And if he did, shout out to you, Thomas. Well done. <laughs> We've already had you talk about how you found the books. We've already had you talk about your godly parenting thing. Any other things from the live show last night that were fun that you wanted to share or anything? Or should we just get right into chapter 15? Nothing I can think of. Let's just get into it. Let's do it. It was a fun time. And again, you can watch the replay on the merch store. It's really good. I watched part of it. The camera work, incredible. Really cool angles. Yeah, there was a camera on the stage pointed up for like a low shot. There was a far away one. There was a whole bunch of stuff. It was a good time. It was a very, very funny show. It was a blast, and I hope we do a whole lot more all over the world. So let's get into chapter 15, I Wrestle Santa's Evil Twin. When we last left our heroes, the Guardians had saved them from the skeletons at the Hoover Dam. They are flying in the air, and because they're flying in the air, Thalia asks Percy to tell her when it's over, which is very cute and sweet. He assures her that everything is fine. She asks if they are very high up. Percy kicks the literal peak of a mountain and says, nah, not that high. <laughs> What if Thalia had looked? <laughs> I'm glad she didn't, but it's a smart decision for Percy to not tell her the truth because it's not going to do anybody any favors. But just the note of him touching the snowy peak of a mountain while saying this was so funny. What a great moment. Zoe explains that they are in the Sierras and that they will be in SF in a few hours, which I think is pretty cool. Also, just note to anyone out there, don't ever call it San Fran. <laughs> ever, 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 ever. Call it SF. Thank me later. The statues, we learn, are named Hank and Chuck, because of course they are. <laughs> and Hank tells Chuck that they could visit the guys at the Mechanic Monument again. And I lived in the Bay Area for seven months or so, and this is a very specific reference. This is certainly an iconic statue, but it's not necessarily in the top 10, 20 things you would say about San Francisco. So that was a very cool reference. I like that Rick is taking the same approach he did to New York stuff with San Francisco, where he's not always necessarily talking about the most obvious things. 
Now, the mechanic monument has these two dudes working on ironwork of sorts. So apparently those guys from that statue introduced Hank and Chuck to marble ladies at the DeYoung Museum, which is another kind of specific reference. It's a really cool museum. And then I think it's also right next to the Science Center. It's one of those things where I think it's in the middle of Golden Gate Park, which is kind of like San Francisco's Central Park. And much like Central Park, where there's museums all around it. There's some inside of it in San Francisco. Cool park. I recommend. This story is cut short, though, when Chuck reminds Hank that the mortals are kids. So they're about to talk about some uh, lewd things they did with (laughs) the marble ladies, which is very interesting. Way to keep it PG, Rick. Good job, Rick. Yeah, this is a classic adults reading know what's going on. Kids might not get it. Perfect little whoosh joke. Grover plays music to pass the time, and Zoe, to pass the time, shoots arrows at billboards and stuff, but she also is sure to shoot at every single sign of a Target department store right in the bullseye, which I think is fantastic. And that could also be a good bit of promotion when the third season Mm. is coming around. If they partner with a Target and there's a big arrow through the middle of it, it could be very fun. I also want to know, does Zoe know that Target is a store? Or does she just see the word Target and then a Target and is just shooting every single one for (gasps) archery practice? I would guess that she knows what it is, but I do think it's fun. This is basically just her being cool, which I don't know if Zoe would be described as cool if you were thinking of adjectives to describe her. So the fact that she's just having some fun, I think is great. Yay, Zoe. Percy tells Thalia that she did a great job back there. Thalia asks how he broke free, and he tells her about Rachel. Thalia reveals that some mortals are just like that, and that sparks Percy to realize that Sally is like that. Now, we already had him say that her eyes were green like his. I don't know if I'm looking into this too much, but similar eyes, similar to his mom. Does Percy have a secret sister? I'm very intrigued. Hmm. (laughs) Thank you for being perfectly vague. As we have established, which I think now has to become lore, anytime a guest doesn't give something away, it's because they're avoiding the trap doors, which I have set rigged to every person who's guessing on the show. Now, when Percy is thinking about this, he points to the fact that Sally was able to see the Minotaur, which I never really clocked before, and that she wasn't shocked by the Tyson Cyclops reveal, and maybe that was because she knew all along she saw through the mist, so... It's very interesting. I don't know what this could be. I don't know how this all factors in, but I'm intrigued to see what's up. Narrative Percy then says, No wonder she'd been so scared for me as I was growing up. She saw through the mist even better than I did. So I'm really intrigued here. Sally's great. We still haven't got extended Sally time. So if we get to learn more about Sally, I think that'd be very fun. Percy says to Thalia that Rachel was annoying, but Thalia says it must be nice to be a regular mortal girl in a way that sounds like she's really given it some thought and potentially yearns for the simplicity of just being immortal. This also made me wonder if the gods can make demigods regular mortals Ah. as like a wish or something. A spoiler for The Good Place if you haven't watched it yet. The Good Place has nothing to do with Greek mythology, but at the Mm. end, they made Michael the demon a mortal, and he Mm. got to just, like, live as a human. So I wonder if they could do the same for Thalia if she were to, like, request that of Zeus. Mm Mm-hmm. So they get to SF, and Percy says that it's, like, a smaller, cleaner Manhattan, and I am offended. I (laughs) was so upset about this. So upset. I think the Bay Area is great. I had a wonderful time living there. San Francisco has some really nice elements to it. It's very pretty. To call it cleaner than Manhattan is a straight-up lie. To call it smaller than Manhattan is accurate, but it is not a smaller, cleaner Manhattan. Like, that is such a stretch. Their public transit system is atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. And it's just so different. I would not consider them the same at all. I was so upset here. (laughs) He describes a little bit more with like the hills and the fog and the Golden Gate Bridge and all the other classic San Francisco things. Zoe tells the statues to drop them off by the Embarcadero building, which is another great and not super obvious call. I'm glad that he didn't say, oh, drop us by whatever the winding street is. Or, oh, drop us at Fisherman's Wharf or Girardelli Square. The Golden Gate is like all the terrible things. I'm glad that he's been picking stuff that's a little more off the beaten path. Chuck says, quote, good thinking. Me and Hank can blend in with the pigeons. And I was very excited that pigeons got mentioned. 
everyone looks at him and then he goes, kidding, sheesh, can't statues have a sense of humor? Which I don't really know what he was going for, except for that they look nothing like pigeons, but I'm not going to complain about pigeons getting more love on the Pro Pigeon podcast. So we're here. We're good. Shout out to pigeons. It's because pigeons are also made of metal. Ah, because you're big on birds aren't real. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Hey, when, eh, you know, it's a theory. The angels drop them off. The team says goodbye to them as the guardians go to hang out with their friends. Percy then realizes that they don't really have a next step. Artemis is somewhere, but where? Percy notes that the monster was supposed to find them, but it hasn't yet, or has it? Then mm. Grover remembers Nereus, which is good, because Percy totally forgot, and I also totally forgot. Because when Percy said they have no agenda, I was like, right, they do have no agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Zoe knows of him, but doesn't think very highly of him. She says to find him, you simply have to follow the smell. And what happens next, I really wasn't a fan of. I didn't note it earlier because I didn't think it was important, but now it was clearly trying to shape what happens next. But when the Guardians land, they scare a person who's homeless. They make this thing of, oh, he's talking to them like they're from Mars, so like clearly making him out to say, oh, this guy's crazy. And now what happens, we're just kind of confirmed, all right, we're getting into uncomfortable territory. Zoe has Percy dress up in clothes from Goodwill to try and make him look like, quote, a typical male vagrant so that he can blend in. And I just, I don't know, it just feels so unnecessary. Really did not age well. No. And I know 2007 book, can't always hold the modern standards to it, but I think it's still important to call out stuff like this. And we talked about this a little bit with Apollo and the train. And I don't know, it's just the treatment of people experiencing homelessness. It's not that it was super terrible, but it was just done in a blase enough way where it's like, oh, yeah, homeless guy. Like the phrase homeless guy and very othering of them just wasn't great. So honestly, my notes in this section are pretty sparse because I just want to get through these pages as quickly as I could. Yeah. Uncomfortable reading it every time. Right. And homelessness certainly is a big deal in San Francisco. Thankfully, more and more organizations are propping up. I would recommend people check out some of those organizations. There's a lot of good charities trying to help people out. And I think the approach, and this is why even when Melissa and I talked and you and I looked this up before recording, you want to say things like people experiencing homelessness or people who are unhoused so that you're putting the emphasis on the person and not the situation. You first identify them as a human, which they are. You don't want to treat them like they're less than human. And then you explain what they're going through, especially because it can be temporary. It's not permanent. It's just like, oh, this is the type of person you are now and forever. We've branded you. It's just gross. So they head to a pier where there's a group of people who are unhoused, and Zoe instructs him to find Nereus, as he will be the one who smells different. Apparently, Percy has to find him and grab him because he'll want to escape, but Percy must force him to tell Percy about the monster. I also don't like this, that the plan is go into these group of people who are minding their own business and tackle a dude? Ugh. Ugh. So Percy goes in, he starts stumbling around because I guess every person experiencing homelessness has to be drunk. This was, I think, the worst of anything. I really didn't like this at all. It was, yeah. There's so many different reasons that you could be in a situation where you don't have a house. And for Percy to think, well, I clearly have to stumble around because drugs or alcohol or whatever has to be in play. <sighs> that was just super gross. So he finds who he thinks is Nereus and he's got a Santa vibe. And I thought, oh, OK, title. Santa's evil twin, sure. Nereus doesn't really feel like evil twin category, though, so that felt like a mischaracterization. I get it's just a chapter title, but I don't know. Maybe he could have just called him his brother instead of his evil twin. I yeah, know. I guess Nereus was kind of bah humbug with Percy. Yeah. But he's not really evil, more just super annoyed yes. that people are always bothering him to answer questions. Yeah, which honestly... He's well within his right to feel that way. If people just bother you all the time, you just want to be left alone, that wouldn't be fun. And I think he was like sleeping, taking yeah. a nap when Percy attacked him. Yeah, not great. I'm interested to learn about Nereus from Dr. Moya because maybe he's a jerk in the Greek mythology and that kind of explains why Rick has written this the way he has. But he seems like a guy who's just minding his own business. <laughs> So Percy goes to grab Nereus, but Nereus grabs him. It causes a bit of a scene. They wrestle a bit. Nereus breaks free. Percy tackles him and begins to explain what he wants. And then he still tries to break free, but Percy goads him into the water, which was a nice move by basically pulling a, oh, no, not the water. <laughs> 
But then they go into the water. Nereus turns into a seal, which is very on brand for San Francisco because all along the piers, you will have seals. He then turns into a killer whale, which Percy is riding, and then he waves to a stunned crowd of <laughs> tourists. Like, this is a very normal thing. Just another Tuesday here in San Francisco. The SeaWorld show. Yeah, basically. I don't know if there is a SeaWorld in San Francisco. I never went. Anyway, Nereus asks Percy why he won't drown, and Percy clarifies that he's the son of Poseidon, and Nereus says, curse that upstart, I was here first, which I like that he calls him an upstart, made me think Nereus has some sort of water power, if it wasn't clear enough by him turning into a seal, and then also a killer whale, so I'm interested to know what's up with Nereus. I also want to know more about Percy's water powers. Does Poseidon make his hands stickier? When he's wet or do his fingers not prune? Yeah, we do know that he doesn't get wet. So maybe his grip would be better if you have the same gripping capabilities as you would when you are underwater. But also, I wouldn't be surprised if he has the, you know, kind of like D&D, you have animal handling. Maybe he has sea animal handling where he can handle riding on a dolphin fin or whatever he's doing. Maybe that is what has allowed him to kind of wrangle these sea creatures. Finally, Percy gets him exhausted and back on the dock. Nereus asks if it's the standard deal where he can go if he answers a question. And Percy says that he has more than one question, but Nereus says, the rule is one question per capture. So I thought, all right, Percy, you have to choose wisely and you have to word this wisely because if he's going to go genie on you a technicality and you say, where's the monster? And he goes, San Francisco, bye. You know, you have to be (laughs) very specific here. Percy thinks of all the stuff that he wants to know. Where's Artemis? Where's the monster? What's the monster? Annabeth. And when he thinks Annabeth, a voice in his head, which is clearly Aphrodite, tries to convince him, yeah, ask about Annabeth. (laughs) But he knows that doing so would make Annabeth the most upset. Classic Charlie problem we've got going on here. (laughs) Percy ends up asking about the monster. And his reasoning is that Chiron told Percy that that was the most important element of the quest. So I like that he deferred to Chiron. That is a very smart move from Percy. Now, Nereus does kind of go genie on him, or at least I thought so, because he says, he's right there, and then points to the water at Percy's feet, and then he goes away. And I thought, oh man, is he just saying, (laughs) you know, the bay, the Pacific Ocean? The water! Right, exactly. (laughs) Now, our team then hears a moo. So I was thinking, oh, uh, uh, what? Is Bessie the monster? And Percy goes, ah, Bessie, not now. (laughs) (laughs) Grover gasps because he can apparently understand Bessie. It is a beast language that he can understand. And Grover clarifies that Bessie is not a she. Bessie is a he. Second time in this book that it's happened, but the first time it was intentional (laughs) because of the whole blackjack thing. Grover says, it's a he and his name is not Bessie. It's here because Percy is his protector and his name is the Ophiotaurus, which is a very fancy name. And I'm wondering if this is a Greek myth thing or just a Percy Jackson thing. At first, though I didn't take Greek in high school, I took Latin in (laughs) high school, but still Taurus, we've played Pokemon. That feels like a bull (laughs) enough where that made sense of, right, okay, male cow, bull, Taurus, got it. Also, Taurus, like the astrology sign. Exactly, which is a bull. Now, Thalia explains that this word means serpent bull. So I guess Ophio means serpent. I don't know. I've never seen this prefix anywhere before. The Ophio Taurus explains that he's running from the bad people and they are close. And I thought, okay, are the bad people zombies? Not zombies, actually. Mm. Zoe is confused about how Percy knows this creature, so he explains the whole thing. Thalia is shocked that Percy forgot to mention this, but Percy basically says, I thought it was a minor detail, (laughs) which is such a great semi-fourth wall break (laughs) because he's really talking about it, at least what I thought, and I'm sure a lot of people their first time reading it. You think it's just a cute little thing, the Bessie side quest. Mm -hmm. You don't think anything of it. You truly think it is just a minor detail in the book. So for Percy to talk about it very much in the terminology of a story, I thought was very funny. Zoe is upset, though, because she knows the story. Zoe said that her father told the tale thousands of years ago and that this is the beast they are looking for. Percy thinks it is impossible because he's too cute. But Zoe says that that's how they were wrong way back when and how they're wrong now. They've been expecting a big, scary monster. But the way that this works is that the monster doesn't conquer the gods. The monster must be sacrificed. And then I remembered, oh, right, the sacrifice. And I think this is so clever. At no point, a million guesses, if I was trying to guess 
who the monster was, or even if someone said, how do you think Bessie, before we knew any of this, how do you think Bessie factors in? I would have thought, I don't know, cute little side quest. (laughs) So it's a great plot twist from Uncle Rick. I never would have predicted it when you read it for the first time. Did you think anything of it? No, I was shocked because they do describe it as such a little cute, fluffy sea creature. Mm -hmm. But no, it's a monster, apparently. In retrospect, it does make sense because it's a very vividly described situation with Percy going with Blackjack and the Hippocampi. It also makes sense because we already got Rainbow. We already have a bunch of other creature friends. It's not like we just need to get a new creature friend every single book. So I guess in my brain, I was thinking, oh, yeah, you know, another person like Rainbow. But we already have Rainbow. So mm-hmm. why would we have Rainbow adjacent? So hindsight's twenty twenty. It makes way more sense that Bessie, now the Ophiotaurus, would factor in even if you don't think a bigger way, at least a different way than the cute sea creature that comes through every now and then. Mm -hmm. Also, I would love a a stuffed animal of Bessie. Oh, yes. Cute little stuffed cartoonish cow serpent thing. That would be so cute. Also, cows are in. Oh, are they? They are. In what way? Just Like like cow print. Oh. Cow themed things. Okay. Thank you for being our Gen Z correspondent here (laughs) of knowing what's cool. I probably won't be buying any cow print stuff, but everybody (laughs) have fun. I'm not going to yuck your yum. But yeah, I think a little stuffed animals, get a little blackjack would be cute. Little rainbow, little Ophiotaurus. Yeah, be great. Disney, come on. Merch opportunities. (laughs) Percy asks how anyone could hurt him because he's so harmless. But Zoe says that there is power in killing innocents, which is a big oof kind of quote, and she even continues, Mm -hmm. terrible power. The fates ordained a prophecy eons ago when this creature was born. They said that whoever killed the Ophiotaurus and sacrificed its entrails to fire would have the power to destroy the gods. Okay, super intense. Grover previously said that Bessie didn't enjoy everybody talking about sacrifices. Now Grover butts in again to say, maybe we also don't talk about entrails here as well? (laughs) So Thalia asks what would happen if the sacrifice was made. And Zoe says, quote, No one knows the first time during the Titan War, the Ophiotaurus was in fact slain by a giant ally of the Titans, but thy father Zeus sent an eagle to snatch the entrails away before they could be tossed into the fire. It was a close call. Now, after 3,000 years, the Ophiotaurus is reborn. Awfully convenient. Awfully convenient, but... It does feel like this is rooted in mythology. I don't necessarily know a lot about this story. I'll learn more from Dr. Moya. But it does feel like this is the basis of the story, kind of like how the Odyssey was the basis of the second book. It feels like Uncle Rick thought of this story and then decided, okay, how do I work around this and work this into my established universe? Thalia sits on the dock, puts out her hand. The Ophiotaurus kind of puts their head underneath her hand, she's kind of like patting it on the head a little bit, but then the Ophiotaurus shivers, and Percy is bothered by Thalia's expression, which looks hungry. And at first I thought, is she going to eat the <laughs> Ophiotaurus? And then I realized, ah, different type of hungry. <laughs> hungry for power. Now, this is where I wrote in my notes right away, all caps, oh, hmm, is this the weapon choice kind of thing? Like, is Thalia not confirmed good? Could she still go either way? And that's basically exactly what happens. Percy says that they must protect the Ophiotaurus because if Luke gets a hold of him, and Thalia kind of finishes his sentence saying that he would pounce on that opportunity and it would be huge. And then they hear a French voice saying, is it would be huge. It is a power that you shall unleash. And it's Thorn. He's back. Gross. Hate this guy. Don't want him to be back. Boo, boo, boo. He always kind of felt like an afterthought to me. Yeah, he felt to me... A little bit like the classic henchman, I had wondered earlier, is he going to have some henchman-related hubris because he clearly doesn't like Luke, and Luke kind of feels like his replacement? We do get a little bit of hubris here, which does seem to be his downfall. But before we get into anything else, let's take a little bit of a break for the Titan's Purse. We'll talk about fun stuff, merch, live shows, live streams. Patreon stuff that we're doing. Lots of fun stuff. Check it out. Don't skip it. It's fun. Don't skip it. Why would you skip it? 
Hello and welcome to the Titans Purse Texas edition, coming to you live from Dallas, Texas, where I got to see Aaron Judge hit his 60-second home run, which was very cool. Got to see some family, go into a wedding, went to the Texas State Fair and ate a bunch of fried food, including fried frozen horchata. Lots of really good stuff going on here in Texas. Speaking of good stuff, let's get into some fun announcements. First, if you've ever thought, my oh my, I wish that Mike Schubert would play some D&D on a live stream on a bi-weekly basis, and bi-weekly meaning every other week, not twice a week, with some fellow podcasts podcasters that he's done other things in the past with, plus one new one that he's not crossed over with, well, you are in luck because starting on October 12th, I will be joining up with the likes of Gabrielle Urbina, Emma Scherzarko, and Beth Ayer, three other wonderful podcast folks, to create a Dungeons and Dragons 5e stream that we are calling 20 to Midnight. It is going to be this wonderfully crafted world. Gabrielle is serving as our DM. The rest of us are the players. And we don't know exactly what the story entails quite yet. But we do know that there is a time crunch for our characters to save the world. Hence the 20 to Midnight theme of it. I'm very excited. We've done some test runs and it's been really fun. We've been sharing some clips on the show's social media accounts. Just little bits and pieces from some of our test runs and we've been putting up bonus content on our patreon for the show and it's really exciting so it's going to be on twitch if you go to 22 midnight.com so 20to midnight.com you can get all the links and the information there but basically it's going to be wednesdays at 2 p.m eastern every other week and then the replays of the show will live on twitch for as long as they let you let replays live and then we'll also be putting them onto youtube and i think eventually we might make a podcast version of it if we get enough patreon support but go to 20to midnight.com to check it all out and i'm really excited to do it Playing Dungeons and Dragons is something I've only done bits of here and there, so to be able to do it with some wonderfully nice human beings on a regular basis is going to be a blast. Now for an announcement that's a little less official, but is very close to official. If you live in Australia, and if you live in or near Sydney, and you're free on Monday, October 31st, I would say just pencil in a potential TNO live show. Just uh, just circle it on the calendar. I'm currently in the process of making sure that legally I can perform in Australia, but I've got a venue lined up in Sydney for October 31st. I also might have some venues lined up in Melbourne in the middle of November, but that's a little less concrete. So once it's official and I make things all 100% legit, I will make a bigger announcement. But for now, if you live in or near Sydney, October 31st, keep that date open. Maybe at like 7 p.m. Just like keep it open. Also, of course, I want to thank the folks who are supporting the show on Patreon. If you go to the newestolympian.com slash Patreon, you can join the Patreon and you can get access to physical merchandise. We have stickers. We have holographic stickers. If you join the Ultra God tier, we've got enamel pins. We also have digital goodies like bonus episodes and director's commentaries and monthly live streams. There's so much fun stuff there. Sometimes if I have to cut things from the episode for time, I put them up on the Patreon as well. Lots of goodies, but I want to thank the newest members of our team. So shout out to our newest Ultra God tier patron, Ginger Spurs Boy. Shout out to our newest super god tier patrons, Ashley White and Fiamma. Shout out to our newest god tier patron, Luna Ryugamine. And shout out to our newest demigod tier patrons, Ariel Andriano, Jenna Means, Kathy Wynn, Ash Bowen, Elizabeth Beck, Gregory Jackson, Jelly, Antonio Hall, Frizzy Lizzie, Victoria, Marina Eggleston, Lady Pie of Athens, Pancake Plant, Christina Teixeira, The Human Daniel, Mary Dombroskis, and Russell Talmadge. Thank you all so much for your support. Inspired by my trip to the Texas State Fair, I hope that Hermes blesses you via your metabolism so that if you ever have an evening of eating lots of food that is maybe not as healthy as fruits and vegetables and stuff, that your body processes it all just fine and you don't have a tummy ache. Also, if you're all caught up on the News Olympian and you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, why don't you listen to one of the other podcasts that I make? There's a fun scripted show that I made called Modern Muckraker, where it's a very different vibe from this, but still incredibly hilarious. I worked with a wonderful team of writers and sound designers and composers and producers in order to make a four-episode season of a comedic investigative journalism podcast. It will sound like you're listening to something from a reputable news source, but in actuality, the questions that we answer on this podcast include, when should Spider-Man take the subway? instead of web swinging? And is the budget of East High School realistic for a public school in Albuquerque, New Mexico? We interview highly overqualified experts. I play a character who's very convinced that this journalism is very important research, and you can listen to it wherever you get your podcasts by searching for Modern Muckraker or going to modernmuck.com. 
And before we wrap up here, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in Dallas, don't be surprised if you hear an ad for literally fried anything. I cannot express to you the wildness of the fried items that were at the fair, including things such as fried charcuterie and fried lasagna rolls, as well as spicy pizza egg rolls. What does any of this mean? No one knows. But once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of the Newest Olympian. And we're back. Now, Thorne is described as looking a bit more disheveled and scruffy. And he says, Long ago, the gods banished me to Persia. I was forced to scrounge for food on the edges of the world, hiding in forests, devouring insignificant human farmers for my meals. I never got to fight any great heroes. I was not feared and admired in the old stories. But now that will change. The titans shall honor me, and I shall feast on the flesh of half-bloods. And I just wrote, okay, bud, chill. He's (laughs) so comically villain. Mm -hmm. He's very, very fun. He's very over the top. But here's where his hubris is coming into play. He doesn't just want to serve the general or Kronos or both of them. He clearly wants some glory. So he has a bunch of mortal security types around him, the mercenaries. And I was thankful. Okay, at least it's not the skeletons. And immediately after I thought this, Percy asks, where are the skeletons? (laughs) Why would you ask that? (laughs) Yeah, Percy basically pulls the, um, Professor, you didn't collect our homework assignment. (laughs) Thorin says that he doesn't need them, and he will prove his worth to the general when he takes down the crew himself. And I wrote, Hubris, thy name is Thorn. (laughs) Do you have a guess for who the general is? Hmm. I genuinely don't know, because I still don't know if it's a god, demigod person. I don't think it would be Layden, because Layden has just been described to be a dragon. My guess, though I don't know what he factors in, because I also don't know exactly what you would describe Zoe as. Do you have to be a demigod to be a hunter? No, they take anyone. Right. So I don't know exactly who he is in terms of noun, but in terms of proper noun, I think he has relation to Zoe. I think he might be Zoe's dad because Zoe's been talking about her dad and being scared of her dad. And then in the dream with Apollo, you had to take something from her dad. I feel like he is related to Zoe because she said she only had sisters and didn't mention a brother. I think that might rule out brother. So maybe the general, and it could be Kronos, but I don't know if it's Kronos. I don't really know how it all works. And her mom is a water spirit. So I just like, I'm always very confused of what plus what equals what. So I don't know what he is, but I think he has family relation to Zoe, potentially her dad. Now, Zoe gets Thorne at arrow point, and the guards all raise their guns, so Percy tells her not to fire, and Thorne agrees, because Zoe wouldn't want to miss Thalia's, quote, great victory. Then, he explains the situation, and I thought it was super obvious just from what has been explained throughout the book, but to make it crystal clear, he explains, oh, That's why Kronos brought you back, so that she could be the weapon, so that she could do all this thing. And then Percy, as the narrator, goes, oh, it made perfect sense. (laughs) And I thought, really, Percy? Like, (laughs) I could maybe understand them doing this for the readers, especially the young readers. Make it clear. I get it. I'm 30. It's not a big deal (laughs) that I put two and two together. But for Percy to be like, oh, wow, yeah, you're right. Like, how did you not (laughs) not recognize this i feel like percy sometimes gets tunnel vision where he's so focused on the details he doesn't get the big picture because i totally relate to this i truly do not know how to see the big picture most of the time yeah i get this too in life i get this with reading the books as i forgot about nereus i i forget things that happened a couple chapters ago granted i usually read these chapters days if not weeks apart (laughs) and it's a little bit different but i totally get that in life A big thing that I would recommend, maybe if scheduling is a factor in that, having multiple like calendar situations, if you're looking at big picture things, help for me. For example, I like to use Google Calendar. Love Google Calendar. Love Google Calendar. They're not paying us to say this, but I love (laughs) Google Calendar because for a week, it'll kind of say all the stuff. So it's nice to look at that for a week at a time. On my desktop and kind of on my phone, the Apple Calendar thing usually shows you a month. Mm. So that's nice. And then what I also do is I just have like a running notes app thing that Kelly and I share, which is just called in all caps, weddings and events. (laughs) Because for us, there's always a lot of planning of, okay, what's ahead? Because usually when I book live shows, it's 
way far in advance. And I want to make sure, one, I'm not double booking something, or two, if I'm already going to be in Dallas for a wedding, hey, let's try to book a live show in Dallas, which I'm doing this year, maybe in the past, if you're listening to this, because we're recording this on August 25th. <laughs> but it's good for me, big picture wise, to think here's all the stuff on the agenda for the whole year. So maybe that's something you or someone listening at home could do. I love a good notes app checklist. Yeah, I'm not as big on the checklist. Kelly's big on the checklist. Kelly has a physical planner that has different combos of stuff where there's month ones, there's day, there's week. So she can use different things for different tasks. So one thing she uses more for work, one thing she uses more for things around the house or life stuff because work stuff has to be more on a day. Like this day you got to do this. But it's kind of like a weekly goal of, okay, you know, send this tax document or take out the compost or whatever. (laughs) Anyway, enough life advice. (laughs) Let's get back to Percy Jackson. Percy is waiting for Thalia to tell Thorne off, but she hesitates, which is very interesting. Thorne tries to talk her into it. You know, it is the right choice. Your friend Luke recognized it. You shall be reunited with him. You shall rule this world together under the auspices of the Titans. You, that was me in question mark, not knowing how to exactly pronounce aus. Is it auspices? Auspicious? The auspicious? I, I have no idea. But then I also didn't know how to say it in a French accent. Moving on. <laughs> Your father abandoned you, Thalia. He cares nothing for you. And now you shall gain power over him. Crush the Olympians underfoot as they deserve. Call the beast. It will come to you. Use your spear. What I want to know is if Thalia is actually enticed by this power potential or if it's something Kronos has done to like twist her mind Ooh. because... I can't remember what he's, like, the person of. Sure. But I feel like he has something to do with, like, mind control. I think you're right because when we learned about Cronus earlier, there was lots of talk about infiltrating dreams and thoughts and stuff and him tempting people. Usually it was more direct where people would see or hear things in their dreams and talk to him that way. But maybe there's a subconscious thing going on. Regardless, I don't think that Thalia is necessarily wooed by the argument of Thorn. I think it's more of just... Maybe something inside her because it is part of a prophecy, part of her destiny, if you will. I think it's more of like an out of body Mm. slash inside of body, but not my conscious thoughts about it situation. Like some kind of weird magnetic pool, maybe? Yeah, I would think it's something more like that. I don't think she's thinking, wow, Thorne, you've really (laughs) made some good points here. French accent's really convincing. (laughs) Percy yells for her to snap out of it, but she looks like she did the day she became a person after being a tree. Percy tries to appeal to the fact that Zeus turned her into a tree to preserve her, and Zeus just helped her out with the angels, but then she grips her spear more tightly, and Percy looks at Grover with desperation, and Grover begins to play a reed pipe riff. Narrator Percy says the guards had been targeting Zoe, and before they could figure out that the kid with the pipes was the bigger problem, the wooden planks at their feet sprouted new branches and tangled their legs. Zoe let loose two quick arrows that exploded at their feet in clouds of sulfurous yellow smoke. Fart arrows! I didn't anticipate Far Arrows making a comeback, (laughs) but I'm so happy that they're here. If you could make a new type of arrow, what would you make? Ooh, a very good question. This is why you're so good at doing the Q&A for the live shows. I thought of this after the Q&A was over. Very good. If I could make an arrow, hmm. I think an arrow that magically made your shoelaces tied together Mm. could be very fun. Mine would be the opposite. It'd be an arrow you shoot into a knot that's too tight that you can't undo, and it undoes it magically. Yeah, that's really good, because I'm not very good with knots. And Kelly's been watching a lot of Survivor, and they have to untie a lot of knots. (laughs) And I don't know if I'd fare well. I was never in the Boy Scouts or anything. I (laughs) struggle with knots sometimes. The guards cough. The manticore fires spikes, but they bounce off of Percy's coat. Percy instructs Grover to tell the Ophiotaurus to go down deep. Grover translates, but I think that's the wrong word. I think interprets is more accurate. I used that in a previous episode because I thought that that made more sense when Percy was wondering why the hippocampi can't interpret between him and this new friend we made. And someone reached out saying, thank you for using the right term. And I was like, oh, cool. My guess was correct. But I think translate is more for written stuff. And it's supposed to imply exact Mm one-to-one translation. Whereas interpret, if you have an interpreter for language, someone says to the interpreter something, and then they do their best to say it and at least get the vibe of it, Mm -hmm. of what they meant in the other language. So I think interpret would have been correct. Not to well actually Uncle Rick, but more of... (laughs) 
someone was very helpful in a DM, which caused me to Google it. So here's me passing along a teaching moment. <laughs> now, Grover lets out a big moo to interpret what Percy was instructing him to say. Thalia is still in a daze, and she just says, the cow. <laughs> Percy grabs her and yanks her up the stairs of the shopping center on the pier. Thorn calls for the mercenaries to get them, and they start just wildly firing into the air. These don't feel like high-quality mercenaries. No. <laughs> well, if they're humans that willingly went along with Kronos' plans, they can't be high-quality humans. No, that doesn't necessarily mean they wouldn't be good, trained marksmen, but I think the mist is involved in all of this, so who knows what they're actually seeing and firing at. Zoe calls for Percy to escape via the sea and to save the Ophiotaurus, but he can't leave the crew alone. He refuses to do so. Grover tells Percy that he has to get the word to camp, and then that sparks an idea in Percy's brain because he had noted crystals in the gift shop making a rainbow in the sunlight. So he slashes a water fountain and he starts to IM. Once he said rainbow, I thought, oh, yeah, baby, here we go. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens. So when he slashes the top of the water fountain, it splashes Thalia. And she thinks Percy's gone mad, but Grover knows what's up. So he rummages around for a drachma, throws it, starts the IM, and Percy screams, Camp Half-Blood. And then we see Mr. D going through the fridge, and he goes, do you mind? And he's drinking <laughs> grape juice, which is beautifully on brand. <laughs> and I didn't really get it until after the fact. Oh, right. Dionysus, the wine dude. <laughs> Percy yells, where's Chiron? And Mr. D goes, how rude. Is that how you say hello? <laughs> Narrator Percy then gives this description. Hello, I amended. We're about to die. Where's Chiron? <laughs> Great. Really, really Perfect this. delivery. So good. Mr. D finds this amusing and asks if he can take a message since Chiron isn't available right now. <laughs> Percy looks at the crew and says, we're dead. Which is, <laughs> uh, this was so, so, so funny. Thalia grips her spear and looks like she's back to normal and says, then we'll die fighting. There she is, our punk rock friend that tries to have cool one-liners. She's back. I wondered, was the spraying of water what kind of helped her snap back to reality? Oh, there goes gravity. Who's to say? I feel like it was. Yeah. Because Percy said it seemed like the fog cleared out of her eyes. Okay. Maybe it was like when Ares angered Percy in the limo and he was able to talk to Aphrodite better and focus more. Maybe it's a similar situation. Mr. D lazily asks what the problem is, and Percy explains, and Mr. D seems very unbothered by it all. Percy is enraged, saying that Mr. D doesn't care if they die, and Mr. D says he thinks he's in the mood for pizza. <laughs> now, does he ever actually explain the pizza thing? Because the pizza comes later, but I don't know if they said he ordered it, or if he put a DiGiorno in the oven, or if he had leftover pizza and he reheated it, which the best way to do that, put it on a skillet and put a lid on it and then dribble water around because then Ooh, you get crispy bottom. Exactly. But not dried out pizza. Uh-huh. Exactly. The moisture of it will melt the cheese. You also can do what I used to do was put it in the broiler because a broiler and a gas oven's at the top and is going to be really heated. You can do that. But then you have to put the pizza in upside down first so that it gets the crispy bottom and then you got to flip it and sometimes it melts the skillet way is the way to go regardless back to percy jackson did he order a pizza how did the pizza arrive by the end of the chapter i don't think he ever says okay my thought was because he was looking through a refrigerator he just put a frozen pizza in the oven mm -hmm. but that is complete guesswork yeah he really doesn't say and i've just control f'd for pizza in the book and it doesn't appear to describe it so I don't think he ordered one because they would have heard him order it. So I guess he either reheated or heated up a frozen pizza, which I don't know. Frozen pizzas aren't particularly good, <laughs> but leftover pizza is very good. I don't know. Anyway, the vibe that I was getting from Mr. D, I know that he will be played by Jason Manzukas in the TV show, which I think is absolutely perfect casting. And maybe it's just because I showed Stephen Para and my buddy Chet the light of the John Wick franchise because they hadn't seen the movies. But Ian McShane, do you know this actor? He's in no, the movies? No, I don't think so. Have you seen Hot Rod? No. Okay. I'll just get a picture of him. He's this guy. I've definitely seen him in something. Yeah. So he's just a classic in John Wick. He's this very stately he's in charge of one of the safe haven hotels and when people are trying to get him to do something he doesn't want to do he very much has this mr d vibe of oh what seems to be the problem and you know will pour himself a glass of wine or something like that so i was getting these vibes but i still think jason manzikas will be fantastic but i was getting some ian mcshane you know i'm just too cool and chill mm, to be yeah. bothered by your frantic situation that i don't really want to help you out with 
The manticore is fast approaching with some goons. So Mr. D says, you could ask in italics for help. You could say please. <laughs> Narrator Percy says, when wild boars fly, I thought there was no way I was going to die begging a slob like Mr. D <laughs> just so he could laugh as we all got gunned down. But Percy reconsiders because he sees a tear, a single tear, roll down Thalia's face. And he realizes that she's done this before. She was cornered at Half-Blood Hill and gave her life to save others. He can't let that happen again. So he mutters, please, Mr. D, help. (laughs) Narrator Percy then says, of course, nothing happened. And I wrote in all caps, don't be so sure. Because literally last chapter, this happened, where Thalia prays and the narrator Percy goes, nothing happened. (laughs) You got to wait more than four seconds, Percy. (laughs) Dramatic effect. Think of the plot. Have we learned nothing in the last 20 pages? Yeah, come on. Are you not reading the book, Percy? Come on. Thorne calls for his mercenaries to spare Thalia, but to kill the rest. And the narrator Percy says, quote, The men raised their guns, and something strange happened. You know how you feel when all the blood rushes to your head? Like if you hang upside down and then turn right side up too quickly? There was a rush like that all around me, and a sound like a huge sigh. The sunlight tinged with purple. I smelled grapes and something more sour, wine. What a great way to describe a hangover to children. (laughs) That's got to be what he was going for, right? I don't know what else that would be. Yeah, maybe he was trying to do some combo of being drunk or whatever. Or just generally disoriented. Right, maybe it's that. But clearly the vibe that I was getting was Mr. D made everyone drunk. And what we see described next, he got them all sorts of messed up. (laughs) I've never done anything like this when I've been drunk. There's a loud snap, and then all the guards just lose their minds. One starts acting like a dog and biting his gun like it's a bone. Two start waltzing with each other. One does an Irish clog dance. And I was thinking, are we sure that Mr. D is not the god of cannabis as well? Because this feels more (laughs) like they've had a strong edible, more so than being drunk. He didn't say they were vomiting or dancing on top of tables or grabbing someone by the shoulder and for way too long in way too close proximity with way too much spittle saying, I love you so much. (laughs) I cherish our friendship. He is the god of partying. Hey, you know, maybe, maybe that gets in there. Yeah, maybe he has combo power with, I guess, Demeter or Persephone for growing (laughs) cannabis and then turning it into... (laughs) (laughs) I feel like Demeter would not approve of that. (laughs) It's a desecration of this beautiful plant I've made. (laughs) Persephone, how dare you? (laughs) I mean, yeah, God of Partying, it's not necessarily out of his realm, if you will. So anyway, they're acting all wild. Thorne is upset, but says that he will handle this himself. But he gets engulfed in vines and completely consumed by them, so much so to where Percy thinks, this dude is gone. Like, it was... Low-key terrifying. I'm really intrigued to see what they do with the CGI of it all, because at least my imagination had this look very scary, a little bit reminiscent of the Robin Williams Jumanji movie with the big scary Mm. vines and stuff, that just kind of wrapping all around and constricting him really tight. Mr. D's powerful. A little like Vecna in Stranger Things 2. Yeah, right. Stranger Things (laughs) T-O-O. Yeah. (laughs) Stranger (laughs) Things 4. Yeah, that's good. He's got all the tendrils going. Yeah, I mean, when you think about Mr. D, the wine dude, a bit of a misnomer because he's messing with people's brains. He's getting vines to do really scary stuff. He's a little more powerful than he may come off. Maybe Nico is right. You know, he's he's got a bad (laughs) rap for not being strong. Mr. D then closes the fridge and says, well, that was fun, which is so good. So, so, so good. Percy is absolutely floored. And Mr. D explains that the mortals will snap out of it eventually because if he made it permanent, he'd have to file a report, just like you had talked about (laughs) earlier. Mr. D then addresses Thalia, saying that he hopes she learned her lesson because it's not easy to resist power. And hopefully this can inform better decision making later down the road. Thalia then blushes ashamedly. Grover thanks him, and Mr. D says, don't make me regret this, but says that they must get going because he only bought them a few hours' time. Percy then asks if Mr. D will help them with the Ophiotaurus, and he says that he doesn't transport livestock, it's their problem. (laughs) Can't blame him. Livestock, that would be quite smelly. (laughs) It would ruin the pizza. Of course. Percy asks where they go. Mr. D says that Zoe will know, and they must enter at sunset today, quote, or, you know, all is lost. Now, goodbye. My pizza is waiting. (laughs) Really good, Mr. D chapter. I've 180'd on him so hard in this book. 
I understand why people liked him more. He's gone from an unlovable grump to a lovable grump, and I'm here for it. Percy points out something that I didn't notice at first. Mr. D earlier called him by his correct name of Percy Jackson when he told them to go. He was saying, now go, Percy Jackson. So when Percy brings this up to Mr. D, he says, I most certainly did not, Peter Johnson. Now off with you. <laughs> and I like that this clarifies that this was a slip of the tongue. Mm -hmm. It wasn't some sort of thing of Mr. D saying, yeah, I called you the right name because I'm proud of you or whatever, which is what I thought it was going to be. I like that Mr. D genuinely slipped up and didn't mean to, but revealed that he cares about Percy. I liked this a lot. Now, Percy turns to Zoe and asks where they have to go, and her face is as white as the fog, and she points across the Golden Gate Bridge to a single mountain above the clouds. I have been on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge for some hiking, not to a mountain, so I wonder if they're referring to an actual mountain, but what she says is, quote, the garden of my sisters, I must go home. And across the Golden Gate Bridge is... Marin or Sausalito? It's where rich, fancy people live in San Francisco. I would not consider this a traditionally scary place, but when you think of the kind of people that live there, yeah, it's a scary place. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you said that you've been to the Golden Gate Bridge, right? And you took some sort of picture reminiscent yes. of Percy Jackson? Yes. When my family went to San Francisco, my mother thought it'd be a good idea to book a bike ride through this company where you pick up a bike at one end of San Francisco and then you bike 10 miles Woof. across the Golden Gate Bridge and then you end up somewhere on the other side and you drop them off at the other store and then they bus you back. Okay. I'm not a bike person at all. This was terribly painful. And I have a picture of me standing on Golden Gate Beach with the mountains in the background Very from that 10-mile cool. ride. Amazing. We'll have to put that on the Instagram as well. Yeah, bike riding across the Golden Gate Bridge is cool. And it is funny when you have to drive across it for logistical purposes, because if I was ever driving across it, I'd go, oh, yeah, it's the very famous thing, but I just need to use it. What sucks, though, is the toll is so expensive because they get tourists who want to drive over it. So the toll is obnoxiously expensive. It's something outrageous. And I remember one time I had to drive somewhere. It was for a buddy's wedding. And I was so upset that <laughs> logistically the best route was to drive over the Golden Gate Bridge. It's like, ah, oh, how do I tell them I'm not a tourist? <laughs> But the problem with riding a bike 10 miles through San Francisco is San Francisco is famously very hilly. It's so hilly. <laughs> I couldn't do more than 50% of it. I just got off the bike and walked. It's so steep. It's not an exaggeration. It is incredibly steep. I've been in lifts that have caught air by going down downhill things too quickly. It's rough. Some places are incredibly, incredibly steep. So yeah, bike riding across, fun. Bike riding 10 miles and then going across feels a little intense. And when you get off on the north side, the hill down is so steep. Yes, yes it is. It is terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I have a irrational fear when I'm on bikes that I'm going to flip over the handlebars and crack my skull open. I mean, valid. so biking is not a fun activity for me. Definitely wear a helmet, but yeah, that's stressful. No, the hills on the other side are very steep. I learned this the hard way once cuz I went hiking up over on that end with my buddy Sal. We were hanging out and we were just trying to go on some hikes. We hadn't done anything around there. So we were just kind of roughing it. There were some trails, but then it's nothing too intense that we were doing. So we were kind of going off trail. And then we learned the hard way that what we had decided to descend was incredibly steep and at certain points went to a road. So it had either a chain link fence or a barbed wire fence or something. So it became much higher stakes than we thought. <laughs> oh, just a stroll through the hillsides of Marin and Sausalito. <laughs> It'll be fun. It was way more intense than we bargained for. Regardless, that is the end of this chapter. That is the end of this episode. Sherry, thank you so much for joining for both of these episodes. It's been so much fun. Thank you also for all the work that you do for the show, like editing and running the TikTok and helping out with live shows. If there's anything you want to shout out, now's the time. Where can people find you? You can find me on my website, sherryguo.com. I will eventually, by the time this episode goes live, put some of the artwork I've made on there. You can also find me on TikTok. My username is Overnight Totes. And you can also find me running the Newest Olympian TikTok page at Newest Olympian. Did you change your TikTok name? Wasn't it something about a cheese it before? <laughs> <laughs> I did because okay. it was tied to videos I'd made like two years ago at this point. Mm. So not really my brand anymore. I feel you. I feel you. And ya. I wanted the username Overnight Oats, but every single combination that I liked was already taken. So I decided to go with totes because I love a good tote. 
Are you a big fan of overnight oats? Is that I love overnight oats. Okay. I have them for breakfast pretty much every day. Okay, yeah. I used to have them more often when I worked at a startup-y job in the six months where I was engineer, then digital marketing, doing podcast advertising, and then full-time after. They had just a big office fridge and stuff. So before I left, I would make the bowl of overnight oats and leave it, and that was really nice. I've never really done it at home because usually I don't have the foresight to make the oats beforehand. <laughs> and I like hot oats enough now where what I do now, one of my go-tos, I always have a peanut butter and jelly, either sandwich or oatmeal thing. And I kind of mm. switch between the two. So if you want to make Mike Schubert's patented peanut butter and jelly oatmeal, you get the old-fashioned oats from whatever, not quick oats, old-fashioned oats. Pour in some milk, and you can also pour in some water. You don't have to go full milk because it doesn't change too much. Or if you have skim milk, that's basically half milk, half water. Pour that into the correct amount if you're making a thing of oatmeal. Put it in for a minute, then take a scoop of peanut butter, put it in for another minute, then get a scoop of jelly, and you can also put in nuts or raisins, and then stir all that in. Let it sit for like a little bit because it's going to be really hot, and then eat it. Ooh, it's good stuff. I like the overnight approach because I do not get up early enough to cook in the morning. Valid. Super valid. What do you put in your overnight oats? I do a almond butter, cinnamon, apple combination. Ooh. Or sometimes I do frozen blueberries and overnight in the fridge they'll melt to like a more normal blueberry texture. Ooh. And it's fun colors too because it dyes the liquid purple. Okay, maybe I'm going to get back. I'm making some overnight oats. It's really good. It's very good. But yeah, for anyone working, if you are not a morning person and you want to be able to grab something and go, it is prime. But when I'm full time with podcasting, I, I have time to make my, my oats and not necessarily have to grab and go. Anyway, Sherry, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thank you for listening. And until next time, as we figure out whatever is going on next in Chapter 16, I literally have not even looked at what the chapter title is. We'll figure that out next time. But until then, I'll proceed you later. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The News to Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schuber. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campomanes and Brandon Google, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you're all caught up in the show and you just can't get enough, I'd recommend checking out our Patreon. At thenewstolympian.com slash Patreon, you can get access to a bunch of bonus content, and you'll also get access to our Discord community, which is a lot of fun. If you're looking to find other communities that aren't linked to the Patreon, you can find us on social media. We're at News Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and we also have a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash the newest Olympian. And I also just launched a TikTok that is being run by Sherry. It's at newest Olympian as well. I'd also love to give a big shout out to our producer level patrons, Lada Bartova, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Emma Cooey, Vicky Garcia, Ellie Hoskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vickstrom, Megan Moon, Tough Bay Fong, Moo Moo Productions, Olivia Y, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Can't I See Weed Brain, Peter Johnson, The Twin, Sabrina Balsiger, Bony Pony, Heather McMillan, Casey Williams, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lowry, Josh Sayer, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Wise Girl, Ashton Gabrielson, Colby, Marco Redhouse, Falcon Joey, James, Christopher William Boucher, Lux, Caden Max, Sam Sam Reby, Carly Allen, Riley Kitas, Mary Kelly, Audra McKenzie, Mrs. O'Leary, Aaron Wood, Tyler Hendricks, Molly Snyder, Rodith Kalna, Milo Kim, Fred Cabras, Harlan Christ, CC Reads 23, Sandkopf, Julia Kendall, ML Oscar Thomason, Noah Bundgaard, Liz Cardigan, Shatzebobs, Miss Zeus's Kid, Michelle Spurgeon, Zachary Hamilton, and Ginger Spurs Boy. If you want to help out the show non monetarily, the best way to do so is via word of mouth. Whether you tell someone about the show who you think would like the show, someone who loves Percy Jackson, or someone who's been looking for an excuse to read Percy Jackson, or if you talk about us on social media, or if you leave us a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you're using. Any of those help, and I appreciate anyone who has done or will do those in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode, and I hope you tune into our next episode where we will be joined by special guest Leah Cornish to discuss chapter 16 of Percy Jackson and the Titan's Curse. But until then, I will pursue you later. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, ASMR Mike. So, inspired by me making the announcement on this episode about me doing a bi-weekly Dungeons & Dragons stream called 20 to Midnight, if you go to twitch.tv slash 20TO Midnight, you can watch it there on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I was gifted a set of dice by a listener named Madison who was at the Portland Live Show, and Madison gave me a lovely set of dice. So for this ASMR Mike segment, that was me opening the case, I'm now just going to roll some of the dice on the table that's in front of me and uh, put the microphone near it, and that will be the ASMR Mike segment. You can hear a whole lot of this if you watch the stream. Okay, here we go. I rolled a 16. I will be rolling the d20 every time and we'll just see how it all works out. That was a six. I rolled it on my laptop instead of on the table. That was a one. <laughs>
<laughs> which is not what you want. I rolled it on top of a piece of my recording equipment and then the table. And let's do one more just straight onto the table. That was a three. Let's end on a good roll. You can't end on a bad roll. A nine? Mm -hmm. Not what you want. Let's try on the equipment again. Ooh, a 10. All right, we'll take it right in the midway. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Or you'll hear me next time, I guess.